trying to score under the post. JJ Williams, the Lions leap in the air. These are the days that you never believe will come again. To win for a Lion, for the Lions in a test match, is the ultimate. As we build up to the 2021 British and Irish Lions Tour of South Africa, I will be speaking to the great and the good of Lions Tours past to get their unique insight into why the Lions hold such a special place in the hearts and minds of most rugby players and supporters. And look, where else would you start other than the man who has been dubbed Mr Lions, having gone on two tours as a player, five tours as a coach, four of which were as head coach, I am, of course, talking about the great Sir Ian McGeekin. Hello, Geech. Morrow, great to speak to you. Look, um, before we go into your career and things like that, I want to know this. I want you to tell us, put yourself back into the shoes of McGeekin Jr. as a schoolboy player, uh, or maybe just starting club rugby. Now, kids... Teenagers today, they know lots about the Lions because they've got the internet, they've got merchandising, they've got 24-hour media, they've got YouTube, all these things are there. When you were around, there were only three channels on TV for a start off, uh, no internet and phone boxes. So what did you, what was the aura, what was your feeling about that, about the Lions, before you got anywhere near it? Um, I think um, the first real interest and closeness to the Lions was actually the 71 tour to New Zealand with, with Barry John and uh, Gareth Edwards and, and that great side. That, um, and, and I was playing cricket at the time pretty seriously. Um, and I remember, you know, people used to have to check scores. We remember the milkman coming round and just checking what the Lions' score was. Or we went to the cricket change and we were talking about it. Uh, because it had been on, it had been on radio, uh, and then you got a summary film of it flown over, whatever, um, and you'd see something on Sports View or whatever it was at the mm-hmm. time on a on a Wednesday evening. So you'd then look forward to it. But a lot of it was uh, that's the first time really um, I, I felt as though there was a closeness and a real interest uh, and wanting to know what the next score was on the on the Lions tour. Because um, I think that was an outstanding tour. Mm-hmm. You know, Calvin James way ahead of his time and just a, particularly a great back line that, um, you know, they, I think Willie John admitted they stood up to New Zealand up front and allowed the backs to, to play behind with some brilliance um, that, that won them the series. Well, look, it's only three years later, 74, when your first selected as a player. Um, wh- talk me through the process of how you found out, what your thoughts were before, because uh, presumably there were uh, mooted selections in various papers. Were you in those? Were you in the first team? Were you in the squad? Were you a bolter? Were you nowhere near? How did it all, how did it all come about? Uh, no, I would say no. I wasn't one that was generally talked about as a, as a Lions player. Um, I'd had my second season of international rugby, um, so I was fairly late into it. Um, I was 25, 26 before I got a first first cap with Scotland. Um, and the first, I think, and only time, I think we'd played Ireland in Dublin and I was flying back to Leeds and um, I was reading the Sunday Times and there was a venerable... Sunday Times reporter Vivian Jenkins, and he'd made comments. They didn't pick squads in those days. They just talked about players who'd had good five nations, as it was. And my name was mentioned amongst the centres, about five or six centres that that were discussed. And that's the first time, and probably really the only time prior to the tour, that, that there was any indication that I was even on in people's thoughts. How did you find out you were picked? Uh, a letter from Byroot, British Isles Rugby Union team. <laughs> and it was those initials on the envelope. 
uh, and on the letterhead. Uh, and I think it was Bob Wayhill who was involved then, like he was, I think, when, when you were involved. Yes. Uh, and it was inviting me to uh, go on tour with the Lions. Um, no indication of anyone else. Uh, who else was picked? No. You had to wait for that, Bill Ellis, will okay? Yeah, right. yeah. That particular time, the political situation in South Africa, apartheid, you know, uh, the, the knowledge of apartheid, the op opposition to it was growing, was being more organised and so on. What, what, what were the, your considerations in relation to that and the reaction of, well, I, I imagine educational bodies might be slightly different to other bodies on that. Yeah, Leeds City Council weren't, you know, Labour Council, they weren't in favour of it. But I think a, a special quorum, my headmaster knew the head of education, the director of education. So I think a small quorum was um, selected from the committee that, that passed my uh, ability to, to go. Obviously, they said they couldn't pay me. Um, so I had to make the choice on, on that basis. And I just felt at the time, I mean, it was fairly hectic that um, I wanted to see for myself, you know, and, and if we're going to make a difference, was it going to be better that the Lions were in South Africa highlighting it or do you ignore it? And I, you know, at the time, uh, I felt that, um, you know, a sport, it was, A, the Lions was something I never anticipated going on and, that, that I'd like to go to South Africa and, and really see see for myself what, what the whole environment was like. And, what do you, what do you and, think you achieved on the, on the tour, on and off the field? Well, it was an incredible tour. You know, I, when we all met up, I was like a little boy in a sweetie shop when we walked into the hotel. I think the first two people I saw were Gareth Edwards and Willie John McBride. And you're thinking, crikey, you know, I've got four months now with, with these players. <laughs> Sid Miller was a good good coach. I really was just excited about about being involved and and, and just knowing you, you're playing with players that you know you'd admired from '71 and that were were great players uh, and just wanted to play rugby as a as a lion. I suppose by then, you know, I really having been involved in international rugby. Uh, then you really appreciate, I think, being able to be selected for the Lions out of a, a, the top group of international players. Can you describe uh, this to me? I'll give my own reflection on it. But the Lions badge is iconic. Um, it is beautiful. When you get it embroidered and braided in the you know little materials that you get on on the on the tour shirt and on the blazers. And you put that on for the first time. Can you remember what you thought? Uh, so putting the blazer on was pretty special. You stood in front of the mirror and then, you know, all you're hoping is, crack, I don't want to get injured in training before I actually put the jersey on. The other interesting thing, Brian, was the jersey. There's only six sets of jerseys to last four months. Right. So they were going in the wash. And the only new jersey I got to keep was the jersey I wore in the first test. Let's fast forward to, to 89, to 10 years, or 15 years later. You retire as a player and you're selected to coach the Lions in Australia. And that's only a year, I think, after you got the Scotland head coach. Is that right? Just a year? Or yeah. How did, how, did, how did that all come about? Were you sounded out before, during? Who Was there a selection process for that particular role? <laughs> No, uh, I was approached uh, in the summer before, 88, by the Scottish representative on the, on the Lions committee, who'd said, if Clive Rowlands asked you to coach the Lions, what would your answer be? So I was a bit taken aback, to say the least. I spoke to Judy, uh, my wife, and said, I've just had a phone call about the potentially coaching the Lions, what do you think? So we talked it through, and uh, she was a full-time student. She was doing a four-year degree at, at Leeds, at the university at, at the time, with two small children. So it was, it was a big call. But uh, was, she just said, yeah, you've got to, you know, you've got to go for it. 
And, uh, and then Clive rang me, Clive Rowland, who was brilliant. And Clive just said, look, I've watched the Scottish backs for the last three years uh, and, and Scotland's attacking rugby. And he said, I want that approach for the Lions. I was still assistant coach when I was actually asked. I had just been appointed head coach, but I actually hadn't um, done anything with Scotland um, at that point. Lions selections are, you know, hugely, not necessarily divisive, but everyone has their own opinion. Usually it falls down on national lines, and, and why wouldn't it? Because everyone has their own prejudices and so on. But you have been through several incarnations of a selection committee. So can you tell us, you know, what they've ranged from and to and why certain systems are better than others, in your opinion? It was always whoever was chairman of the Lions committee right. determined how the Lions was put together. So in 1993, four years later, I was sent a letter saying, and I think it went to all four national coaches, the Lions tour is coming up. Do you want to apply for the head coach? So you had to do a written response back. And then there were interviews. And we had uh, uh, at the East India Club in London. And so we had an interview. The full Lions committee was there. They must have spelt into all four coaches, whoever. I don't know who the other letters went to. Well, I know Dick Best was obviously got, got was one that got uh, a letter as well. Uh, and then after that, I was offered the position and Dick had been offered the position of assistant coach. Uh, and when we came to selection, there was a committee of about nine. You were nine and then you had the coaches as well. So, uh, about 12 people having an input? Probably, yeah. I, I, that, I, all I remember is a lot of people around the... And, and then it makes a lot more but, sense to me now, Geach, that selection process. <laughs> when, I, when I see yeah. what came out of the other end, um, it makes a, a great deal of more sense. Because I've always thought, you know, surely the message, you're, you're in charge, you take input from other people, yeah. but it's your neck. You're making the yeah. decisions. So I would have thought, right, I'll listen to you all, but when it comes down to it, you know, and if, if all, say, three, four are against me, I have to take it seriously. But... Yeah. Apart from that, we'll agree. We we'll have to agree every position. But apart from that, you know, um, we're not going to go much further yeah. than the, these, these these four walls. Yeah. Well, uh, you're right. I mean, there was players there that were that were voted on that mm. uh, when that that uh, weren't my first choice. Put it that way. So when Fran Cotton asked me in '97, would about and again a change again. Fran as manager had it was his choice. Uh, he picked the coach. So Fran just rang me up and said, did I fancy coaching the Lions again? Which I said, yes, because I want to get... And I said, Fran, two conditions. I said, I want Jim Telfer as forwards coach and I want you, me and Jim to pick the squad. I said, if we're going to fail, I want to fail with the players that, that we've chosen, not that somebody else has chosen. With the first tour of the professional era, how did that differ in relation to the... 89 and the 93 tours to Australia and New Zealand because of professionalism, if at all? Yeah, uh, the big difference, Brian, was was they gave me the ability to go to South Africa the summer before and watch the test series with New Zealand. And whilst I was out there, I spent a week with the All Blacks, uh, their training, talking to them, Sean Fitzpatrick, the players... They were they were good, very good, and uh, they they said certain things. I was asking them because I hadn't been to South Africa since I was there as a player, uh, and the the thing they the biggest thing they said is have control of everything, your training gear, your hotels, your travel, it's all your side. You keep control of everything, and that's what we did. We all, we took all our own kit out. We took two lots of kit out two scrummaging machines with two articulated lorries travelling between training so that there was always the right kit at the next venue. Mm -hmm. And also, having watched them and watched them live, I could see the game that we were going to have to play if we wanted to win the Test Series because that, that was the first Test Series New Zealand had ever won in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So talking to them was great about you know what it what it felt and and what it what it needed. So all that 
allowed then me to put together, you know, and I spoke to Jim about it a lot and Fran, of the type of game, the type of player we had to look for. And the biggest, for me, the biggest one was players with open minds that, that can actually be prepared to adapt and change and, and work off each other, really. And, and um, you know, if we had that, then cumulatively we'd, we'd start to evolve a game that I felt we, we could put together that would give us a chance in the Test Series. To be honest, Brian, I'd learned a lot that I kept from 89 mm-hmm. in, in the, the conversations with players, you know, that just asking or there were opinions of things that as, head, as coach, you haven't got all the answers. I learned that really strongly in 89 that actually all the answers were in the group, mm-hmm. you know, uh, as long as I was prepared, or, you know, and Roger, we, we'd listen and we'd discuss it, but we knew where we'd got to be. And one of the things I put on the back burner was some of the things I wanted to do with the backs because actually I knew the winning was somewhere else. In it. And having that conversation again, I felt we had to have that in 97 for everybody really to be... Uh, playing a game that that they all collectively understood. Why, why Martin Johnson? Because he wasn't uh, yet England captain. <laughs> no, I think I think a Lions captain has to re- have the respect of the players first and foremost. And I, I, John, I was coaching at Northampton at the time. He was at Leicester, so there were some big head to heads, East Midland derbies, and you, I just. You know, when you're there, you see the presence John O had on the field, even though he wasn't captain, not just with his own team, but with the opposition as well. You know, he had an impact. Uh, and I spoke to Dino about him and I said, look, I know he hasn't, he wasn't even captain of Leicester at the time. I said, I said, look, I just, I've, I've got a feel, I just want John O, you know, to be captain because I, th- I think he's the one player, A, it's it's second row and it's the heart of where we're going to have to be to beat South Africa. Uh, but he's a player that I think everybody respects. How would he? How would he take to it? And he'd accelerated in '93 when he came over and got into the Test team. Dino said no. He said he'll be good. And then I, I, so I did say to Jim and Fran, look, I said psychologically the first toss of the coin at first Test. South African captain is going to have to look up to the Lions captain physically. And and I just felt his presence and the way other players reacted to him was what we needed. This is your Everest, boys. Very few ever get a chance in rugby terms to get for Everest, the top of Everest. You have the chance to do. Being picked is the easy bit. To win for a Lion for the Lions in a test match, is the ultimate. But you'll not do it unless you put your bodies in the line. Every one jack of you for 80 minutes. Defeat doesn't worry me. I've had it often and so have you. It's performance at Mars. If you put in the performance, you'll get what you deserve. No luck attached to it. If you don't put it in, if you're not honest, they were second raters. They don't rate us. They don't respect us. They don't respect you. They don't rate you. Geech, I'm sure you remember that you were there. Everyone who loves rugby has probably heard that, that speech of Jim Telfer. Made your role to play on that tour. One of my regrets is actually never having been coached by him. I would have been, it would have been an interesting dynamic, I think. That's all I would say. <laughs> um, you know, you... If the coaching ticket changed between you and the way you, you did things, but how much did he bring to you and the Lions success and, and, and why? I think we just got on right from day one, really. I was lucky. When I came through into international coaching, again, I, you know, I didn't anticipate it at all. Uh, there was Derek Grant who became Scotland head coach and I became assistant. And Jim had just finished. He'd just come back from the 83 Lions. Um, 
And they were two fantastic mentors because we just taught rugby in a way. They're both back row players. I played most of my rugby at halfback. Um, we talked a lot about that decision making, that play through the back row and, and the contact area and so on. And, and um, some of the conversations we had were, were were fantastic. I mean, I learned such such a lot. But we saw rugby in a similar way. I know we approached it differently, and you know we were two different characters. But actually, we knew what we wanted as as outcomes of of breakdown work, and and um, but also having spoken to the All Blacks, knew just what we had to do up front. Not not to beat South Africa, but to get equality, to take away from them a strength that they perceived they had. And and if we could do that, we could then play rugby in other areas and it would be a different test series. I mean, I said that all the time. And if if we were in a score with 20 minutes to go in the test matches, I felt we would, I, and I said that to the players, that I felt we would win. And Jim and I just evolved. So, you know, he, he'd be working at breaking down the set piece and every, all about just getting this ability to stay in the game and uh, not lose control. Uh, and, and he was brilliant with the players. I tell you what's interesting, with the Springboks in particular, there's not much different, you know, from then till now and going on as far as I can see in the future. Because if you don't front up up front, that you, that's it. I know that's the case yeah. in, in lots of games, but uniquely with South Africa, you simply have to do that. Because they yeah. are the one side, even bar New Zealand, who can and will overwhelm you. Because... I feel they they feed off off insecurity, physical insecurity, and so on, and it emboldens them in a way which it doesn't for any any other team. And I, were you were you aware of that then? Yes, uh, and it hit me when I watched the series the year before. Mm -hmm. I, I knew you could see it firsthand, and actually, the first thing I did when we met as a squad, I just said to Jim, "I want to show the last minute." of the last test um, with the All Blacks uh, because it was one metre from the All Blacks line uh, and eventually they're pummeled um, and South Africa knock on and the final whistle goes and some of the greatest All Blacks, not one of them is on their feet. They are all off their feet, either on their knees or on their backs because they've nothing else to give. And I just said to the players, you at some point will have to go through that if you want to win this series. And it was Sean Fitzpatrick, Zinzanbrook. You're looking at some of their, you know, best ever rated players mm. had absolutely nothing else to give uh, to win the series. So you win the first test. I'll go on to the, um, the your speech, uh, another iconic speech in a second. But huh. you at this thing... The 89 team is the only Lions team, I believe, to have lost the first test and then won a series. Now, how different is it that week, having lost or won? <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> if, you, if you win, I think you just want to keep everything in line and not overdo things uh, and keep it simple and straightforward. The great thing in 97 was... The non-test group were playing fantastic rugby. And one thing that always hit home to me was after the first test, we were going to a Mexican restaurant for dinner at about nine o'clock at night or late kickoffs. And Martin Johnson, he stands up in the bus and apparently it was Scott Gibbs that told him, but he said to the test players, he said, I want everybody on the bus, test team, 9.30, because... You've got to hold the bags. There's a Lions team playing on Tuesday night in Orange Free State. Um, and so whatever you do tonight, on the bus, 9.30, no question. Uh, and it was that sort of thing. It wasn't a midweek team. It, wasn't a, it was a Lions team that just kept going on the field. Uh, and I think that when we lost in, in uh, 89... Well, we got hammered, um, actually. We, we got hammered. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, it, it, you were back to 
up front and getting control. You know, Nick Farr Jones, Matt Liner were were incredible that first test, and I think it came out of conversations, and you were probably in one of them that we had to make sure that if whatever ball Nick Farr Jones got, he couldn't do a lot with, mm-hmm. and and the only way we were going to do that, you know. Teague was fit again, which was quite important. Um, Wade Dooley, you know, came in. We we just made changes which were to say, right, we're actually going to try and dominate possession and take away their perceived strength, which is, you know, to me was the halfbacks mm-hmm. and, and their ability to free up um, the way they played. Um, I know I did go over the top a little bit with Robert Jones, <laughs> uh, beforehand, but well, you, you couldn't uh, predict how Nick Nick Farjones would uh, would uh, would, uh, would would react to that simple act of standing on the foot. Like, look, just just <laughs> uh, just we get this out of the way. What's your approach to having to tell someone you're out of the team? Say a Norster, you know, I'm Norster was an iconic figure yeah. with the Welsh players, very si- significant psychologically. I know that the Welsh players didn't take it well in eighty seven, eighty nine when he was down, but. You know, Cutler was five inches taller and, and significantly a significant yeah. presence. What do you do? Is it is it a standard speech or no? I, I it, it was just that thinking. I talked about having to dominate their front five, and Bob Norster was probably the most skillful second row that you had, but he wasn't the most physical. And and I and I said, look, we've just got to have that physical edge about us up front. Um, and 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 put the biggest men in. So it wasn't. I wasn't saying you're not playing well or you're not good enough. It was simply we had to play differently to get ourselves back into the series mm-hmm. and try and and do something that was that was slightly different, which which needed that physicality mm-hmm. about it and that edge about it that you know wasn't a natural part of his game. Prove that the lion has claws and has teeth. We've wounded a springbok. When an animal is wounded, it returns in frenzy. It doesn't think. It fights for its very existence. The lion waits, and at the right point, it goes for the jugular. And the life disappears. Today, every second of that game, We've talked about what they're going to do or everybody else has. We go for the jugular. Every tackle, every pass, every kick is saying you're dying. Your hopes of living in this test series are going. You've won the first test in 97. That speech, before the second test, 1997, has gone down in Lions and Sporting folklore. Look, like, how did you prepare for that? What you were going to say, when you were going to say it, in what tone, in what <laughs> manner? I think it, I, my own mind went back to 1974 and the third test in Pretoria, uh, sorry, in uh, Port Elizabeth, where we'd won two, and if we won in Port Elizabeth, we'd won the series. Uh, and that remains the hardest game of rugby I ever played in my career. And the first 40th or the first 38 minutes, we hardly got out of our half. And this was, you know, a Lions pack that had dominated South Africa. They had a team talk by Gary Player before they came out. Um, and we just had this wall of physicality that just kept coming at us at a different level. And I had that at the back of my mind that, I just want the players to understand what's coming. Having come in, here's South Africa now fighting for their lives in a in a test series. And and I kept going back to thinking what it had been like. Dick Milliken, my centre partner, we talked about it years afterwards, that there wasn't a lot of talk on the field in that Lions team in that first half. All it was was action and commitment. And sometimes you did, literally, we looked at one another to just make sure or there'd be a point or the eyes going one way to go into the next position or to put you in a position where you could do something just 
to stop them scoring. We weren't winning it, but we, one thing we weren't we weren't losing it. Yeah. And and it, it was that really. I went for a long walk in the morning and just tried to get my head around, you know, how I wanted to try and say it for the because I wanted the players to understand that, but actually just stay in the game because they would get opportunities in that last 15, 20 minutes. And who did it turn out to be the saviour again? Um, the Mr. Guscott. It would be Guscott, wouldn't yes. he? It would, he, <laughs> he would just have to be him. But, you know, what a, what a brilliant player. As tense as you can, as, as you can get in a test match. Where, where would that rank in your memories? Yeah, high. Very, very high indeed. Just a, a great feeling of, a t- you know, the team that had been under the cosh didn't give anything away... Uh, when they were and actually came back um, and won it. It was a bit like that. I always pair that with the third test in Australia where mm. I'd, had a, I'd had a meeting beforehand with Bob Templeton, you know, the Aussie press oh, yeah. were absolutely having a real go at us and, uh, and various things with, the, with, with Rob Jones and Nick Farr Jones and just had a conversation with Bob and, and he knew that I knew how we could beat Australia. Um, but we both agreed we'd, you know, not raise the temperature too much. Bob was good and he knew it and he knew we weren't going to change. Well, a lot, I mean, he, he came to Quinns and coached Quinns for a couple of years when I was there. And I remember chatting to him about this and he said to me, I remember we had a fucking meeting and we wanted to go on about this. And I said, no, don't talk this, don't mention that. It looks bad, it looks weak. He said, he got out of he went in the press. And of course, you know, when Cutler's coming out, he's six foot ten, weighs nineteen stone, saying, "I'm afraid for my life in the line out." What do you think is an opposition player thing? Oh, marvelous! <laughs> Absolutely marvelous. The last couple of days, I've been reading a, a book about previous. Um, I forget the guy who wrote it, which covers the the '93 tour, the '83 tour, and it just came across as a, a, a considerable kind of a tour that was quite unhappy. And they seem to run out of players. So uh, it was all based on these facts that I set the tour up like like it's been set up. You know, I, I you know, passionately believe behind the scenes this is one of the uh, uh, happiest lines trips has been in terms of players getting on, coaches getting on, management getting on. Let's just skip over the, the, the 2005 experience uh, quickly. Um, it was a special tour in this sense it, in that the Lions never looked like getting anywhere near in any test at all. Now... I can't think in any of your other coaching incarnations with the Lions that that, that, that occurred. There was always a possibility. Um, uh, 1993, arguable, could have maybe won the first test if that yeah. decision had gone a different way. Frank Bunce, yeah, he'd come down with a with ball. Dino, did he handle it? Did he not? What was it like going through, you know, a significant losing experience? I mean, not, 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 worse still, not getting anywhere near. Uh, yeah, it was different. I think Clive probably had to do what he did. Um, but the game then was nearly, you know, 10 years old professionally. And he, what he tried to do was put a test team together early on in the tour and just give that team chance to work together. Um, you know, I agreed to go on because I know to go on the tour because he asked if I'd uh, the midweek team. And I said, yes, because. If the midweek team's right, then the test team is right. Yep. And and what I wanted to do was give as much as I could to having the test re- team in the in the midweek team, sorry, in the best frame of mind. We changed one or two things because I have, I asked Clive. I said, look, I want to take the midweek team down a day early and stay in the areas and go out for a drink at night and. Um, but Clive kept the others, they flew in, watched and flew out again. So they only had these certain hotels. So I think professionally, it probably had to be tried. I think what it proved is the Lions is a different challenge. And you have to try and give every player every opportunity to think that he's got a chance of putting a test jersey on. And Bill Beaumont, who was manager on that tour, he and I went, we had a day together, went off Waiheke Island or somewhere and just talked through all the lessons learned. And, you know, I just said, Bill, you, you know, 2009, we've got to 
try and make sure that the players feel that they've got every opportunity. Um, I didn't anticipate they were going to ask me to coach again. To be what, honest, what, what made you go back? What mean you know? What made you go back as head coach? Because I I wanted to try and leave the Lions in a place where I felt they should be. Mm -hmm. I wanted players to feel the same way about the Lions that I felt as a player and as a coach and that, you know, other groups of players before have felt. And and so, you know, I did the same. I was out a, a year early. I got Gats involved. You know, Gats and I by that time had known each other for 10 years and he's got a great understanding of, of players and people um, as well. And, and we did the same. We, the, the coaches picked, we picked the squad. We didn't vote on anything. We discussed everything. And what we were looking for was, you know, I've kept saying not, not necessarily the best players, but the best players for a Lions tour. And, and, and that, inc that makes good people. You can't get away from the fact that attitude and how you approach it, how you come to terms with disappointment, if you're not in the test team, all the other bits that are so different on Alliance Tour. And I wanted just one last go to say, look, I want to try and just put out there what I really genuinely believed players who were putting Alliance jersey on in 2009 had the opportunity to feel. The fact that there's a lot less people, I suppose, than, than what I've been used to is, is the best thing about it. I think uh, everyone's on the pitch at the same time. Um, everyone's in and around the gym at the same time. Everyone's in and around the team room at the same time. And um, that's harder with a bigger group, with a small, intimate group like we have. Um, that's been happening. And it's, uh, yeah, definitely, I think there's, there's a, a lot of good friendships we made, a lot of characters emerging already. And... Uh, that's going to be a big thing for us. I mean, you know, as I, I said a week ago, the, the talent is there in the group. The coaching is there in the group, no doubt about it. Um, it's us becoming a team. And I think last week was a, a good good step towards that. Paul O'Connell, as, as captain, a, uh, a reflection yeah. of the, the job that uh, Jono had done or just fulfilling those criteria or, the, or a combination of both, probably? Yeah, a bit both. I was really impressed with him in 2005. He had a natural presence. Um, he'd got respect of the players. He wasn't captain, you know, though, wasn't he? He wasn't captain Ireland. No, uh, Brian O'Driscoll was. But, um, you know, Brian had had a lot of pressure in New Zealand. He got injured in that test match. And I wanted him to actually just be on a Lions tour, enjoy it, and not have that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that uh, Paul O'Connell, for me, again, front five, uh, respected by all the players, and I knew Brian O'Driscoll anyway, as a natural leader, would, would just be great support for him, as, as he was for Brian in the Irish team. One reason why Irish rugby changed was that group of players mm -hmm. who supported each other so closely. Um, and actually, I rang Brian before uh, they announced any announcements um, to say that, you know, I was picking Paul O'Connell as captain. And he, he was over the moon. He wanted to ring him up and congratulate him. I said, <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> For goodness sake, don't do it yet. I haven't told him. You yeah, know, so. put, a bet, put a bet on first. No, no, no. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, and it, he was great on the tour. And, and uh, I, I did, you know, well, hopefully, in the end, it's only players will will know, can say whether, you know, they feel that there was, you know, as good a Lions environment there as, mm. as could be. You lose the opening test match. Very close again, 26-21. I remember the scrum was, uh, you know, struggling yeah. a bit. Again, you've got to deal with that. What were your thoughts having come out on other lines to us on the positive and negative side? So nothing's unfamiliar for you, but did you think it was eminently able to be turned around? Yeah, I, I think... You know, we were probably a bit lightweight again in certain positions, um, and we made we made some changes. Phil Vickery had got on the wrong side of the referee. I don't know why, and I think some of that was just a viewpoint from from a referee, to be honest. But once a referee sees it one way, you know, and I just said to Gats after we, we, we've we've got to change Vicks because you know we've got to change what the referee thinks he's looking at. Yeah. Um, and, and so we made those changes. And the second test, 
I think Gats and I both felt we should have picked Simon Shaw ahead of Alan Wynne Jones at the time, actually, who was just coming on to, you know, the international, the test match scene. Um, and Shaw's, to me, still remains one of the most underrated oh, second completely. rows. Completely. Um, he was unbelievable, the second and third tests. He he just, Victor Matfield, um, they, they just, well, suddenly they were not a threat. The lineup, everything looked different. Mm. And um, Shawsy had two unbelievable test matches. Well, and, might- and so we knew we'd probably made, again, a selection error by not just putting that power in from the word go. Well, I mean, it might have been different if... Um- if uh, Berger had been sent off when he should have been, you know, for gouging, <laughs> that was, I mean, yeah. it was, I mean, I, so I remember, I remember this distinctly because I'd gone over to Ireland um, to speak at a car phone warehouse sort of weekend, which was to do with the Lions. And I was, so we watched the test in a pub with, a, with their employees, you know, I was, uh, it was a good day, it was a good earn, actually. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, <laughs> how, the, how is that not a sending off? But then, you know, the last play of the game with Ronan O'Gara. Now, you know, there's nothing personal, but I remember saying in the debriefing afterwards to the person, of all the things he could have done, there was one thing that he should not have done, and that's what he did. He could have done anything else, and it had probably been okay, but he didn't. You know, you, 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 get, yeah. you get the penalty, and, you know, what happens? What, what, what were your thoughts at the instant time as the ball went over and then trying to deal with the dressing room in the, in, we're losing in that way. Yeah, it, it's still probably the most physical test match I think I've ever seen. Uh, that second test in Pretoria was an unbelievable game of rugby. And we played some great rugby that, that day. I mean, the same in the first test. I mean, it was the rugby we were playing was probably as good in test matches as it had been for a while. So we were ahead. They came back. We, you know... It, we lost both props and both centres. So suddenly, you know, it was make-up time as Stephen Jones kicked well that, that day uh, and we got back to 25-all. 25, uh, 25 uh, and I think, you know, we all felt that w- with the changes on the field and everything else, just let's let's take the draw and go for broke in the third test. So... When when the when the penalty was called, then I'm think that that's all I'm thinking. He's going to kick this from ten yeah. meters inside his own half yeah. on a on a ground he knows well. So it was a big disappointment, and you know I'd said to the players beforehand, it's I've never seen Simon Shaw so ups, upset mm. at all. And the players, you're looking at a group of players who've given absolutely everything for a jersey and I've come out of it you know just three points the wrong side of a result and uh, I'd said to them before the game it's not the jersey they put on it's the jersey you take off mm-hmm. that you remember uh, and I'm looking at them all in that dressing room it's probably the lowest I think I've ever felt in a dressing room that day They've said we've, there's nothing to play for it's a dead series Mind you what Gat said on Wednesday, I think we've everything to play for. Because today will determine what we are. It will say everything about us. There is business to attend to. Whether you want to be there, don't want to be there, whether your innate competitiveness demands that you put things right or, or whatever, you've got to play that fixture. You, how do you approach that week? Uh, well, we made nine changes. Mm-hmm. I think, but with all the injuries, when I spoke to the players on the Sunday morning, I, I, I just said, have a break. Y- you know, the last thing I think we, we could have done or should have done was then have a big session and a big review, you know, on the Sunday morning or the Monday morning. So uh, there was two things on offer. I said, you can go on safari for two days uh, or you can, the family's out, or you can go back to Joburg and just have two days off, play golf. Do whatever you like. And I said, but I want you back on the field on Wednesday morning, ready to win a test match. Because I said, if we pass this Lions jersey on, it has to be a winning jersey. So that the next group that take it up are actually putting a winning Lions jersey on. And um, 
Uh, the, the training on the Wednesday and the Thursday was quite incredible. I, I kept the film of, the, of that, the videos of it, because he, it, it was quite uh, incredible. It was quick. It was accurate. We didn't change anything. We knew exactly what we had to do. And I was looking at a team playing at such a pace uh, with accuracy. And this is with eight, nine changes in it. Uh, and you then to, you know, leave leave the Lions jersey in the best place possible for the next group to, to pick up. Well, funnily enough, you've come to the conclusion I was going to draw you towards because it is my definite feeling as well that the temporary custodianship is yours, but when your time is in the sun, it's your responsibility and it's uh, in your own hands as, as much as you, you, you can make it to make sure that um, your custodianship is one that's memorable. And I think if I have to pick anything out for the enduring, one of the reasons for the enduring legacy is that that feeling I feel and I hope persists. Think back to 2009, we didn't play any of the South African players in the lead up to the, the test match. And so we'd run and played pretty well and, and had won those lead up matches and we probably went in that first into the first test reasonably confident from where we were and then all of a sudden we came up against the, the, the test players in that first test and, and we got a little bit of a, a hurry up in terms of the physicality that they brought and looking the first half of that first test against uh, against South Africa we made changes in, in the second half and got back into the game and in the second test you know, it was a, we made changes in our type five and it was, it was a close encounter so look I've definitely le learned from that experience. We've got a 37-man squad. Um, I've read your thoughts, um, you know, prior to that and the, and the selection and so on. Um, everyone can argue about individual players. Is there anyone that you think, given your joker card, you might have played? One thing the selection did for me was actually show how many good players we've got around in the Northern Hemisphere at the moment, in the four countries. Uh, and it's more you could make... Um, an argument for seven or eight players who haven't been picked that you cannot make an argument against anyone who has. Mm -hmm. Because I think you, I can see the logic in, in, in the selection. I can see why players are there. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good, you know, and I think Gats said well-balanced, and I think he knows... And you said it earlier, Brian, you can't get away from the physicality that you've, you've got to match it, not necessarily beat them there, but actually play a game that is slightly different to one that they expect. And, you know, I don't know if you feel the same. I, I just think Lions rugby is so personal to that group. It's never repeated. Nobody else plays No, I was going to say way. they will define their own version of this. They will, def yes. And I think that, that squad has got the ability um, to do it in different ways. So, uh, yes, you can argue for players who are not in it, um, but equally, um, there isn't any strong reason you could give for any of those players not mm. being in it. Just uh, one more on the squad itself. You know, Alan Wynne-Jones, to many people's eyes, stand out captain in terms of what he's achieved and so on. One of the things that always impressed me about Finlay Calder he was the first captain who had ever said to me, if I don't think I'm playing well enough, I won't play. I won't <laughs> pick myself. And, yeah. and he meant it. Like, yeah. like a, a lot of the other mad things that he meant as well, like fighting in the First World War and things like strange things. But, he, um, <laughs> but, he, but um, you know, uh, you, can't have a, you can't have a captain who, who is not going to make the test team, can you? I don't think so, no. Personally, no, I'm not saying that Alan Wynne-Jones won't. I think he will. I oh yeah, no. I think he's uh, Brian. I think he's the standout choice yeah. for captain. It was the only way. The way the Six Nations went, mm. the way Wales went, he's he's got you back to the respect that a captain or a player needs from the other three countries. Mm -hmm. And I think he has that. There is no question that. And his own work rate, his effort, his off the field behavior, attitude, everything about him is what you need for a Lions captain. And you'll have a save on the toying cost as well, like you said that Jono and 
you know, yeah. and Finley and other and other 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 people yeah. had, yeah. Yeah, but Finley did he did say to Clive and I after that first test, don't pick me. Good job, Andy Robinson. <laughs> never fit, isn't it? Really, but the um, look, the, look, just uh, this is the last one on this on this particular one. Uh, it's going to be COVID managed. You can't do anything about it. No one wants it to be, but they are. It does make it more problematic in, in lots of ways. We know that. But is anything specific might hurt the might hurt the Lions because of the way in which they'll have to comport themselves due to these restrictions. I think it's already had an impact on selection. I think they have definitely looked at attitude and approach of players in how they react to that disappointment or the pressure of not being able to do certain things or whatever. Uh, and Because I think, to me, that is so important this time that the off-the-field attitude and approach is going to have to be so good from everybody collectively. And... and uh, that's why I think probably, I mean, I don't know, that there will have been a lot of conversations between the coaches about um, how a prayer approaches different things see, see, away do, from the rugby field. See, normally, you know, in a, in a squad of 30-odd, you can find a way not to be around people you don't get on with because there's lots of things to do. But you can't, there's enough time when you're forced to be together just in terms of travelling for people to get on your nerves and you to get on other people's nerves. But I just think with the COVID stuff, there'll be no hiding place. You can't just slip out around the corner with three or four of you and, and just, you know, have a, have a, let, let, let steam off for 10 minutes, you know, having a yeah. private rant and then everyone comes back and they're, they're fine. This is, this is the thing for me. All the, uh, the intensity of it is going to be overwhelming uh, in terms of the experiences, how they're magnified because of those because of those restrictions. Yeah, I'd agree. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where I think Gats will probably be thinking about the things he can do. You know, can they go shark, fishing, swimming, whatever, uh, as a bubble? Can they play golf as a bubble? Um, I think the thing they'll miss is the contact with South Africans, yeah. you know, and you can't get away from that. But I think you're right. That that strength of being in the bubble means that what they do do has got to be so well defined that they don't they don't underestimate how how well they've got their behaviour has got to be mm-hmm. to actually stop any, particularly with South Africa being you know, in, in such a strong pandemic at the moment. Mm. Well, so Ian McGeekin, um, <laughs> we could, I don't know about you, I could talk for a long time, but um, that's all we do have time for. Can I just say, um, it's always a pleasure to speak to you, memories, insights and, and so on, uh, into this line story. And of course, uh, people listening, you can get Ian's wider thoughts on all rugby things in the Sunday Telegraph and there'll be a link to his columns in the episode description here. Just remains for me to say to uh, Mr Lyons himself, thank you very much, sir. It was a pleasure. Brian, thank you. Pleasure this end as well, as always.